Take your Bibles, turn over to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. As you know, we'll be celebrating Thanksgiving this Thursday. And if you have been here any length of time at all, you know that we believe that Thanksgiving is an attitude to have all year and not just an event for one day. Now, to help us have this attitude for all year, we're going to be looking at Psalm 100, a Thanksgiving psalm. I believe if we can understand the truth of this psalm and put it into practice, that it will enable us to have that attitude of Thanksgiving all year long. And that is the main truth today. Well, what was the point of the sermon, you might ask, around the dinner table? Well, this is it. Thanksgiving is an attitude for all year, not just an activity for one day. Now, let's look in Psalm 100. First, the psalm deals with the attitude of gratitude. And secondly, it deals with the attitude of thanksgiving. And it's important that we see the structure of this psalm, and it has a very beautiful structure to it, and I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and stand, and we will read through it, and I will point to the structure, as you will see it on the screen in front of you as well. First, we have the response of gratitude, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with thanksgiving. Then He gives the reasons for our gratitude. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. And we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Then He gives the Attitudes of thanksgiving and the response of thanksgiving we are to give. Enter His courts with thanksgiving. His gates with thanksgiving. His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. And then He gives us the reasons we are to have these actions of thanksgiving. The Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And His faithfulness to all generations. You may be seated. May God bless the reading and most of all the obeying of His Word. Now the first thing I want you to realize is that these responses are commands in Scripture. In the original Hebrew, they are all commands. They are not suggestions. God is commanding His people to give these responses of gratitude and of thanksgiving. Now I'm going to reverse the order as we look at this psalm. I am going to give you the reasons for our gratitude and thanksgiving first. And then talk about the responses that these reasons should elicit from us. And I'm doing that for a reason. The reason is I believe our responses to God must be based on truth. Not on emotions not on uh, how we might feel or what somebody else might think, but our response to God must be based on His Word primarily and on His truth. And so we're going to look at what His Word says is true about Him, and then we'll look at the response that that truth should bring about in our lives. And then we're going to spend a few moments after I preach, the reason I'm preaching before we sing our normal number of songs, we're going to give you an opportunity to enjoy responding to the Lord with our gratitude and thanksgiving. All right, first, the reasons for our gratitude. Number one, our Lord alone is God. Verse three, know that the Lord, Yahweh himself, is God. Now, you know when in the English translation you see all caps for Lord, In the Old Testament, it's telling us that actually in the Hebrew, God's proper name, Yahweh, is being used. 
When Moses said at the burning bush, who should I say sent me to you? When the Israelites asked, who sent you? Who should I say? And God said, say, I am, or Yahweh has sent you. And so God gave himself that personal name to the nation of Israel, and I believe to the church. And so when he says Yahweh himself is God, all the nations had their gods. They thought their gods were God. But Yahweh, Israel's God, says, no, I alone am God. Now we looked at this last week in great detail, so I'm not going to belabor the point this morning. But what he is telling us is that our Lord alone is God. That we as Christians worship the only true God. Now our gratitude starts when we recognize that the only true God, Yahweh, has chosen to reveal Himself to us and to save us by His grace. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read this. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. Now, why should we always give thanks? Why is Paul saying? Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Our gratitude begins when we realize that the only true God, Yahweh, before anything was created, in the beginning, He chose those whom He would save. And if He did it in the beginning, before anything was created, it's an unconditional choosing and election. That God chose us purely because of His sovereign good will and pleasure. That's all. He didn't look at me and say, well, that A.T. Stewart's going to make a preacher. Let me choose him. Oh, no. No way. He didn't look down the tunnel of time and say, well, he's a pretty good old Joe. Let me choose him. No. In the beginning, the only true God if you're a Christian, chose you to be His. And He even knew all the sins you would ever commit, and He chose you anyway. Now how about that for love? He saw your rottenness. He knew all the things you would do, but He chose you anyway. Now, that will cause gratitude to just rise up within you. So first, our response is based on the truth that Yahweh, our God, alone is God. Secondly, the Lord is our Creator. He says, it is He who has made us and not we ourselves. Now you're not here by chance. You're not here by evolution. But you are here by a loving design of a Creator God. When we recognize God is our creator, we also recognize our total dependence on Him. Paul was telling those guys at Mars Hill in Acts 17. And he made from one man, that is Adam, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Having determined their appointed times, and the boundaries of their habitation. For in Him we live and move and exist. Now look at this. Look at what it's saying about your Creator God. First, He determined when you would live. He determined the times, the appointed times that you would live. Now me for one, I am glad I wasn't born 250 years ago. Ladies, you would need to particularly be glad you were not born 250 years ago. You say, why? Well, no washing machines for one thing. Go out there and rub it on the rock. No microwaves for a second thing. No electricity. So no electric ovens for another thing. No vacuum cleaners for another thing. Man, think about it. 
how much better it is, how glad I am that God had me born right in this period of time. I praise Him for it. I thank Him for it. And He determined that. You're not here by accident. But not only did He determine when you would be born, but He determined where you would live. He says, and the boundaries of their habitation. Now I have visited a few countries in my day, not, not anywhere close to all of them, but I've visited several countries in my day. I have read about most of the countries in this world, but let me tell you, I have yet to find one I'd rather live in than the old U.S. of A. I mean, you go to another country, you see the difference. You can see it clearly. And I praise God that He chose to have me born in the United States of America. And not someplace else. And if you're here today, you need to praise God that you are living in this country today by His design. Because He determines the boundaries. He determines where we will live and where we will be born. Because He is our Creator. Thirdly, our Lord is our Shepherd. He says, we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Now with this part of the psalm, the psalmist is making it real personal. You know, God can be creator and not be that personal, right? I mean, He can be God in that sense and think of Him being way out here. But when the psalmist speaks about Him being our shepherd, this makes it very personal. Because in the Old Testament days, the shepherd knew his sheep. He knew their names. He named them. They knew His voice. It was a very personal relationship. In fact, the Lord Jesus picks up on this imagery in John 10. When He says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. And even as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. God knows us personally and loves us deeply. Now, as our shepherd, he is also our protector because the shepherd protected the sheep. Sheep are about as defenseless an animal as you can find. Our Lord protects us. He protects us from the attacks of the enemy. He protects us from Satan's harm. He is our protector. But not only does he protect us, but he provides for his sheep. The shepherd was responsible for providing for the sheep to provide the food that they needed, to make sure they had the rest that they needed. When they were sick, He would anoint them with oil to help bring healing. He provided everything they need. And our Lord, our shepherd, will provide everything that we need. Paul says in Philippians 4, And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ. And so you cannot have a need that is too great for our God to meet. It can't happen. And when we realize this, it causes our hearts to swell up in gratitude. So now we see the truth that leads to the actions to express gratitude. Our Lord is the only God. He's chosen us before the foundation of the world. That our Lord is the Creator, and that our Lord is our Shepherd. Now what response should this bring out of us? First, we are to shout joyfully to the Lord. Now how long has it been since you shouted to the Lord joyfully? How long has it been since you just shouted? Some of you might have shouted at the football games this weekend. Some of you might have shouted at your children. Some of you might have shouted at your husband or shouted at your wife. But God never commands us to shout at football games. But He does command us to shout to Him. Man, I see these people at football games that are screaming and shouting like banshee Indians. But Sunday morning, they sit like a wooden Indian. Now something is not right in that. 
I'll jump up and shout and scream at a football game and then sit mute before my Lord. When He commands me, shout joyfully to the Lord. Now over in Revelation chapter 5, this is a scene in heaven. Now, a few times in Scripture, we get the privilege of looking into the heavenlies, the holy of holies. Here we have one of them. I want you to see what's going on here. I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads. That means countless. Thousands of thousands. Saying with a timid voice. Huh? Loud voice. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Now this tells me shouting goes on in heaven all the time. Now if it's right for heaven, can it be wrong for earth? Mm. Mm. People say, well, it's not dignified, preacher. Well, now... What's the definition of dignified? That which is proper in the presence of a dignitary. Would you not agree? Now, what greater dignitary in all the universe is there than the Lord our God? And so if shouting is proper in His presence, then it is dignified. Hallelujah. Secondly, we are to serve the Lord with gladness. Do you serve Him with gladness? I mean, it's easy to serve the God with weariness. It's easy to serve God with resentment and dread. And we know we ought to help that person out, but we know we ought to teach that class. We know we ought to work in the nursery. But it's reluctantly. It's in weariness, not in gladness, that we do it. But when we realize that our God is the only true God and He has graciously chosen us, that He is our Creator and we owe everything to Him and He is our Shepherd and He will care for us and protect us. When we realize all of this, then we really can serve Him in gladness for the gratitude of everything He's done for us. The third command in response to the truth about God, is that we are to sing joyfully to the Lord. Now, a natural expression of our gratitude is joyful singing. Now, do you ever find yourself so happy, so joyful, you just kind of break out in song? I mean, am I the only one who does that? I mean, I must be walking around the house and my heart's so filled with joy, I'll just start making up a song. Praise you, Jesus, hallelujah. You know, just something like that. Just excited about the Lord. Do you ever do that? Try it sometime. I want you to do something else sometime. Try shouting to the Lord. Right? Get by yourself if you need to. And just shout to the Lord. Hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. Just shout it. Boy, it's going to free you up. You'll be surprised how freeing that is. And you're following the Lord. You're being obedient to Him. So what do we have so far? All right. First, the reasons for our gratitude. Our Lord alone is God. Our Lord is our creator. Our Lord is our shepherd. And we are commanded, therefore, to shout joyfully, to serve Him with gladness, and to come before Him with joyful singing. Now we move to the second part of the psalm, and we have the reasons for our thanksgiving. First reason for thanksgiving. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. There we have it in verse 5. For the Lord is good. The foundation of our trust in God is His eternal goodness. Now think about it. We can trust God because we know that He is eternally good. Psalm 119, 68 says, You are good and do good. Because God is eternally good, He can do nothing but what's good for you, His child. God can only do what is good. His 
Grace is based upon His goodness, not some whim that might change at any moment. He is good, it is His nature to be good, and therefore He cannot be anything else. All that comes from God is good. His decrees are good. His creation is good. When God finished creation, He said, it is very good. God's laws are good. God's providences are good. It cannot be otherwise than good because God is good. Now, his goodness is evidenced all around us. It's evidenced in creation. It is in the way He made us. Psalm 139. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. Everything about the human body shouts God's goodness. Think about that. Now, I, I could just mention one thing and you, you would clearly understand it. Taste buds. Man, have you ever had that congestion in your head and you were just totally stopped up? And you couldn't taste anything? Now, I know some of us like tasting more than others. But I don't like it. My head's all stopped up and I can't taste anything. God didn't have to make it that way. He could have made everything bland and you just had to eat to stay alive. But in His goodness, He gave me taste buds and olfactory nerves so I can smell that steak cooking out on the grill. Mmm. Mmm. You ever run, go driving down your neighborhood and your window's open and you smell that steak and you said, somebody's having steak tonight. Boy, that smells good. I appreciate that when the scripture talks about those sacrifices being a pleasing aroma to the Lord too, yeah? And then that baked potato, that salad. Just sit down and start tasting that good old southern sweet tea. God didn't have to give us taste buds. It's part of His goodness. Look at the sunset. Look at the autumn leaves. Do you think a deer out in the woods looks up at the sunset and says, my, that's a beautiful sunset? Do you think a cow looking down at the grass says, my, that's a beautiful color of green? You think a dog might look up at the sky and the cloud formations and say, man, that, that's beautiful. No. Why did God make the beautiful leaves? I mean, He could have made the leaves just fall off and function without the beautiful colors. He could have done that. He did it because He's good. For us to enjoy the beauty of His creation. Flowers don't have to give off a sweet aroma to be used for pollination. But God placed the beautiful colors and the aromas that we can enjoy them. That's His goodness. That makes me want to thank Him. Everything. The ultimate expression of God's goodness is the sending of His Son to die in our place to take the wrath that we deserved upon Himself. To take my sin upon Himself. And God's goodness is the very life of our trust. Nahum 1.7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in Him. So the first basis the first reason for our thanksgiving is because God is good. And He's always good. Secondly, His loving kindness is everlasting. Now that word loving kindness, translated steadfast love in the English Standard Version, is that Hebrew word that speaks of God's covenant love, hesed. And we've talked about it here before, but it's that covenant love of God where God commits Himself to enter into covenant with His people. But not only does He make the commitment, but He wants to make the commitment. He joyfully makes the commitment. And He has a loyalty to keep that covenant. 
And not only that, but he gets personally involved with his people. The psalmist says, Thy loving kindness is better than life. Now what did he mean by that? He meant if I had to live without God's loving kindness, if the choice was to live without God's loving kindness, or die with it, I'd rather die and have His loving kindness. His loving kindness is so great. God's personal involvement in the life of His children is so great. His personal relationship with His children is so great, I would not want to live a day without it. That's what the psalmist is saying. As we were saying, one day in His court, meaning one day in His presence, one day in covenant with Him is a better than a thousand, a million elsewhere. Because His loving kindness is better than life. His loving kindness is everlasting. Look, it will never end. You never have to be concerned about His loving kindness running out. Ten million years into eternity, He's not going to say, Okay guys, my loving kindness has just run out. Everybody go to hell. No, you don't have to worry about that. His covenant loving kindness is going to be on me and you forever. It is everlasting. As Isaiah 54 says, For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but the loving kindness, my loving kindness, will not be removed from you. And my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Nothing, absolutely nothing, Nothing can separate you from the loving kindness of your God. Paul says, For I am convinced neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That makes me want to shout everlasting loving kindness on me. And His loving kindness is seen most of all in Him sending Jesus to be our Savior. As 1 John 4, 9, By this the love of God was manifested in us. His covenant love. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. But not only is His loving kindness everlasting, but His faithfulness is to all generations. The idea here is our Lord's trustworthiness and His dependability. That God will remain loyal to His covenant with us and you never have to think about anything other than that. He will de- we can depend on Him to keep His promises to us. He promises He will forgive our sins and He'll never stop forgiving our sins. He has promised to keep us saved and He will never cease to do so because His faithfulness is from generation to generation. He promised to prepare a place for us in heaven and He will prepare that place for us in heaven. He promises He will never desert us nor forsake us. And because His faithfulness is from generation to generation... You'll never have to be concerned about Him ever forsaking you or deserting you. God's dependability, God's trustworthiness is never in question. And this brings a joy and comfort to me as I know from generation to generation. As I look back at the generations that preceded me, as I look forward at the generations that come after me, I trust my God's faithfulness is going to be with my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren and my great-great-grandchildren until Jesus comes back. Now, if that won't cause you to get excited about Jesus, what will? Now, let's look at the responses that this truth about God should elicit out of us. First, the command. Enter His presence with thanksgiving. This speaks of coming before God in thanksgiving and praise. And our praise and thanksgiving honors God. It honors Him when we thank Him. 
Because it requires that we recognize our dependency upon Him. And we recognize that what we have comes from Him. Not only to enter His presence with thanksgiving, but enter His courts with praise. Now we thank God for what He does. Sending the rain, providing our daily food, and we praise God for who He is. For His trustworthiness, for His righteousness, for His truth. We praise Him for who He is. Angels praise God. Look in Revelation chapter 5, again, that scene in heaven. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Thomas Watson, a Puritan preacher, said, In prayer... We act like men. In praise, we act like angels. See, angels don't pray, they praise. So when you're praising God, you're being angelic. You're acting like angels. Praise Him as the only God, our Creator, our Shepherd. Praise Him for His goodness and His loving kindness and His faithfulness. Genuine praise brings us into God's presence. Psalm 22, verse 3 says, Yet you are holy, O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. The psalmist says that when we praise God from a genuine heart of love and adoration and gratitude, it brings God into our situation in a special way. Try that. Next time you're going through a difficult time, just stop and say, wait a minute. I want to praise my God. And you begin to praise Him for who He is. And you will sense Him moving into your situation in a special way. Because He's enthroned upon the praises of His people. And then thirdly, we're commanded not only to enter His presence with thanksgiving, His course of praise, but to bless His name. Most expressions of gratitude and praise are the result of a heart committed to the Lord. To bless Him carries the idea of love for Him as well as gratitude. Well, how do you bless the Lord? Well, Psalm 103 tells us, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget none of His benefits. That's the way you bless Him. By not forgetting His benefits. Who pardons all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Who satisfies your years with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. That's the way you bless Him. By remembering all His benefits. Your child comes up to you and says, Mommy, I want to thank you for fixing supper tonight. I want to thank you for washing my clothes. Does that bless you? Does it? You know it does. Dad, I want to thank you for going to work every day and working and working so that I can have clothes to wear, I can have a roof over my head, and food on the table. Does that bless you, Dad? Yes, it blesses you. So what do you think it does to God when we thank Him for what He does for us, when we remember all the great things He's done for us? It blesses Him. So when you spend time just rehearsing back to God all of His goodness toward you from taste buds to having uh, uh, the ability to heal when you've been cut, praise God for it. Thank Him. Bless Him for it. So how do you have an attitude of thanksgiving all year? It's first you recognize who your God is. That He alone is God who chose us. That He alone is our Creator who made us. And He is our Shepherd who guides us and protects us. That you realize that He is God and that He is the Lord Almighty and that He is the one that we owe our complete allegiance and obedience 
and his loving kindness is everlasting, his faithfulness to all generations, and he is good. All right, we're going to just spend some time doing this. Is your heart primed, pumped, ready to express your thanksgiving and gratitude? I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. And let's praise our Lord. Let's lift up that joyful voice. Let's shout joyfully to the Lord. We do welcome you, and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our Internet. And I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team. Uh, this is Filiberto Medina, who is our Hispanic pastor. And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our minister of community connections. Uh, and to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area, uh, and it doesn't matter what race you're from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, I want you to know you are welcome at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org.